Hello, thank you for that introduction. Um, just so you know, Dr. Burrington, we've been around for over six years. <laughs> I've been here for six years and I've been there the whole time and it existed before I came. But um, like she said, um, my specialty is PMNR and I did a fellowship in interventional spine. So my practice here is mostly the non-surgical treatment of back and neck pain is mostly what I see. Um, my referrals come from um, PCPs, but also surgeons that think that, okay, this person doesn't need surgery, but there's a lot of other options we have. Um, and I'm also sort of a first stop for a lot of people where I have back pain, but I really don't want surgery. So that's where you come and see somebody like me first. Um, but we also do some, like she said, you know, joint stuff. Um, and let me... Okay, so the ob objectives of my talk today, I have 20 minutes, so it's hard to get into too much detail, but I just kind of want to basically review some spine anatomy because I think it's important to know that to really understand what goes on, what can cause pain in the spine, and then the big thing is red flags, um, when to image spine, and then just a brief overview of what are some of, the, what are some of these non-surgical treatments that you speak of. So um, low back pain is, is um, a very, very common complaint to not only ERs, but primary care physicians. Um, it's probably the first or second most common reason that people go see their doctor. Uh, in the 2000s, pain got a lot of recognition by the federal government. It became, it was a congressional mandate for pain. It became the fifth vital sign. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big deal. We always ask patients, zero to 10, where's your pain? Um, we, put a lot of, we put a lot of bank in that. So the effects of pain, why do we care so much? Well, me being a PM&R person, I care a lot because it affects people's quality of life. And the most important thing to me is, what can you not do that you want to do because of, because of your back pain or your neck pain? But it also costs a lot of dollars in our economy. There's a lot of, lot of loss of productive time because people can't work because of their back pain. And a lot of times people go to work, but they can't do their job because um, they have to either do light duty or something like that. So here's how I think about the spine. I think of the spine in three compartments. I think of the anterior compartment, which is the vertebral bodies and the discs, the neuraxial compartment, which is the nerves, and then the posterior compartment where you have the facet joints and the muscles. So anterior compartment is the vertebral bodies. The biggest thing here is the compression fractures. Compression fractures most commonly occur in osteoporotic patients, does not have to be trauma-induced, but it can also be trauma-induced. Once somebody has a compression fracture, their risk for another compression fracture increases five times. It can cause acute pain, but after the bone heals after three to six months, they can still have pain in that area, and that's where some of the more posterior compartments come into play. There are two main areas in the spine that are most vulnerable to compression fractures. This is because there are two mechanically compromised regions of the spine. One is the mid-thoracic area, and that's because that's where you have the most kyphosis. The second is the thoracolumbar junction, and that's because you have a non-mobile thoracic spine meeting a very mobile lumbar spine, and that becomes a very vulnerable area for compression fractures. So most of the time you're gonna see them at kind of T12, L1, L2, sort of in that area. <coughs> The other part of the anterior compartment is discogenic pain. Discs hurt, and discs hurt because either they're degenerated, they have tears, they're herniated. This is a diagram of a very, very popular study that was actually done in the 1960s in Europe. It's a study where they measured the pressure on the third lumbar disc based on body position. So you can see on your very far left, yes, left, that the least pressure on a disc is you laying on your back. The worst thing you can do for your discs is what you see on the opposite end where you're sitting, you're bent forward and you're lifting something. The outer one third of a disc is where the nerves are. So if you have a tear, sometimes on a radiology report you'll read like an annular tear or an annular fissure. Sometimes it's referred to as a high intensity zone that suggests an annular tear. Those can hurt because that's where the nerves are in the discs. Then you also have the herniations, and the herniations hurt because they can cause radiculopathy because they sit on a nerve. And so you get sharp, stabbing, burning pain in the leg, the arm. Um, sometimes you can get paresthesias, and if it's advanced enough, you can actually get weakness and, and dropped reflexes. 
So then we go, so that's the anterior compartment. Then we go to the neuraxial compartment, which is where the nerves are. Nerves hurt for a lot of different reasons. One, you can have stenosis. You can have a narrowing in that spinal canal, either because of a herniated disc or sometimes you're just born that way. Um, and then the nerves, if they get flared up, that's where you start having the radicular symptoms. So radiculopathy is sharp, sudden shooting pain. It increases with coughing, sneezing, straining, anything like that. I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody that says, oh, I was driving and I really had to get something out of my computer bag in the back seat. So I reached over, I twisted, and I lifted my laptop out. And ever since then, I've had this back pain shooting down my right leg. Um, repetitive is also a big deal. You know, I have a patient that works in a Ford factory and lifts 100 pound tires all day long from here to here. Eight hours a day, five days a week does this. Um, so that can cause some degenerative issues as well. Then we have stenosis. This is the narrowing of the spinal colon. I already, I already mentioned earlier what are some of the things that can cause that. The hallmark sign of spinal stenosis is neurogenic claudication. What that means is you have leg symptoms, whether it's pain, weakness, numbness, tingling, something like that, because you don't have enough room in your spinal canal. So the classic shopping cart sign is where you see people bending forward because bending forward actually opens up the space back there. They feel better, but as soon as they stand up, they start walking, they get the, the leg symptoms again. The posterior compartment, so we did anterior, we did neuraxial, and so the last one is the posterior compartment. The big one here are the facet joints. The facet joints are the joints of our spine. They are true joints. They are a synarthrodial joint. They are, subjective, they are subject to arthritis just like any other joint in our body. Uh, facet pain, the other thing where I see this a lot is not just arthritis, older people, things like that, but something called adjacent segment disease or adjacent, adjacent segment breakdown. And this is where a patient has had some type of fusion surgery. Let's say they had an L4-5 fusion a few years ago. They did great for a while, and now their back really, really hurts. They don't have the leg pain, but their back hurts. Well, if you're fused at two levels, what ends up happening? The level above and the level below compensate for that, and the facets break down. So you get facet-mediated pain above and below the level of the fusion. That's <coughs> called facet-mediated pain. There are options we have before surgeons will go in and extend the level of the fusion. There's certain types of injections and blocks and things like that that is pretty effective for that. So facet-mediated pain is axial pain. It's in the neck, it may go down to the shoulder blade, it's in the back, it may go down to the buttocks, the back of the thighs, but it's not gonna go below the knee, you're not gonna have neurologic deficits, nothing like that. And you see those changes on x-rays and MRIs. So red flags, this is sort of a key slide in my talk. Um, I looked at a lot of different um, sources for this, and this was kind of the common list that came up between all of them. You can read those yourselves, but the big ones, cancer, weight loss, infection, bladder dysfunction, night pain, saddle anesthesia, any type of neurologic deficit, whether it's weakness or a dropped reflex, fevers, chills, history of trauma, or age over 50, especially if they have history of compression fracture or osteoporosis. There are also red flags for neck pain, which is similar to that for back pain. Um, the main exception is patients that have RA. I usually have a lower threshold to image them just because of their instability at their C12 joint. Um, and then, you know, in the neck, we're thinking MI, we're thinking arterial dissection, so all the, the, the uh, symptoms that come along with that. So when I think of, okay, back pain, what is causing your spine pain? 98%, the majority of back pain is mechanical, meaning there is something mechanical there that's causing the pain. Whether it's arthritis, whether it's a herniated disc, whether it's a bone spur, something like that, compression fracture, the minority of back pain is what we categorize as non-mechanical. And this is where you start thinking tumor, some type of inflammation, infection, osteoporosis, a neuropathic joint, something like that. But I, I do think about it, but the majority of back pain is mechanical. So when do we image back pain? This is a big, 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 big hot topic. Um, we're at a radiology conference, so the American College of Radiology appropriateness criteria for low back pain, which we agree with and comply with, um, is that imaging is considered for people that don't get better after six weeks or if they have a red flag. And a red flag are the things that we just talked about. So imaging, well what do I order if I need to image back pain? What are the imaging choices for back pain? There's x-ray, 
X-rays are very good at showing alignment, instability. You can get flexion extension films, especially in people that have had surgery or fusions or something. I will often get flexion extension films just to make sure they're not shifting their bones around as they're bending forward and backward. Um, if you want to look at any instrumentation or fusion, and of course if there's any type of trauma, if you have a very advanced age patient, something like that. MRI. MRI is the initial imaging modality of choice in complicated back pain. Complicated back pain is back pain that's been there more than six weeks or has a red flag. It is uh, very good at looking at, soft, uh, at, looking at um, nerves and discs and things like that. Now, do I order an MRI with contrast or without contrast? The three times I usually order MRIs with contrast is if a patient has a history of cancer, if you suspect infection, or if they've had a back surgery before. The nice thing about our radiology department here is they screen all the MRIs that come in, and so they will actually look at the history and say, oh, this person may need contrast. They will call you and say, hey, I think this person needs contrast. Are you okay with that? So that's something, don't, don't fret if you don't know whether to order with contrast or not, because we got your back. Um, CT scans. CT is used if MRI is contraindicated. Um, but also it provides superior bone detail. So if you're looking, if a, if a surgery took, if a fusion took, if the bone's fused, if you're looking at any bone graft integrity, something like that, you can get a CT scan. <laughs> CTs do have a lot more radiation, as we know. Then there's myelograms. Myelograms, these are usually ordered by the surgeons, mostly for surgical planning. It's an intrathecal dye of uh, intrathecal contrast injection. They do a lumbar puncture, they put dye in there, and you can actually see the stenosis and, and all of that. So like I said, it's used mostly in surgical planning. So, so we, we found the pain, they've had it for a long time, or maybe not a long time. What do we do about all that? What is the goal of treating spine pain? To me, the goal of treating spine pain is functional restoration. Get, your quality, get their quality of life back. Get them back to doing what they want to do. And this is done through a lot of different ways. It's done through rehab, such as physical therapy. It's done through medications. And it's done through interventional procedures. So physical therapy is a broad, broad, broad topic. There's a lot of different types of physical therapy for back pain. One of the more common ones that I subscribe to a lot is McKinsey. That's a specific type of physical therapy for disc pain, radicular pain. They're stretching. I put posture on here just because, think about it. You know, a lot of our patients sit in front of a computer all the time. And I know these are a little bit exaggerated, but a lot of them probably are not that far off from doing this every day and have neck pain or back pain. We actually have therapists here that will do what's called an ergonomic evaluation where they will go out to their work site and fix their phone, fix their mouse, fix their computer screen, fix their keyboard, give them a foot rest, you know, do whatever they need to do to optimize that workspace for them. And then we have medications. We've all seen this before. This is the analgesic pain ladder where we start low and we go higher. This is where you start with things like the bottom of the um, the grid is Tylenol, your NSAIDs, and then you get a little bit stronger, 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 and the very top are things like the morphines and the fentanyls. <clears throat> so Tylenol or acetaminophen is an analges analgesic. It does not reduce inflammation, but it's a good drug of choice for mild to moderate pain. NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are used for reducing swelling and inflammation. I prescribe NSAIDs a lot. Um, one NSAID, although they're all NSAIDs, one is not just like the other. Some people respond better to some than others. It is worth trialing different NSAIDs before you give up on the whole category, unless they have a contraindication, kidney disease, stomach ulcers, things like that. There are over-the-counter NSAIDs. There are prescription NSAIDs. Then we come to the COX-2 inhibitors. COX-2 inhibitors have fewer GI side effects because of the way they work. There's this whole pathway here, which I'm not going to get into. So the COX-2 inhibitors we have left are meloxicam and Celebrex. Biox and Bextra was pulled off the market about 10 years ago. The reason for that is um, a study that was done and some researchers, this, was, this is actually from Time Magazine. So this is the cartoon that came out when all this was going on, that COX-2 produces something called prostacycline. And that is something that opens blood vessels, prevents platelets from clumping. But if you block that, then you get blood vessel constriction, you get platelets clumping. So patients that have a history or risk factor for stroke, heart attacks, it can increase it. So COX-2 inhibitors are contraindicated in those patients. 
Then we have muscle relaxers. Muscle relaxers are centrally acting agents. Their biggest side effect is sedation. Some of them can cause, um, can lead to dependence with long-term use. So muscle relaxers are not meant to be taken for long-term, but in the acute phase, it can be, it can be effective. But sedation is a big, 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 big side effect. And then we have opiates, which work through the mu receptors. And I'm just going to leave it at that, because you could probably have a two-week conference just on opiates. <laughs> Uh, so then we go to interventional spine procedures. There are so, 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 so many type of interventional spine procedures that we can do. A patient that comes to me and says, oh, I had an injection five years ago and it really, really helped. Can you just do that again? Well, okay, but what did you have? Well, it was a cortisone something. Well, that doesn't really narrow it down because most injections use steroid. Um, and there are a lot of different types of injections that we can do. When I think about what type of injection or procedure do we do, I divide it the way I think about the spine. There's posterior, there's neuraxial, and there's anterior. So the posterior compartment is where you have the muscles and the facet joints. The facet joints are the joints that I was telling you about that can cause arthritis. Well, we can actually put steroid in there and calm it down, just like you do a knee injection or hip injection or a shoulder injection. And they can be quite effective. There are also medial branch blocks where we can block the nerve that send the pain signal to those joints. We can cauterize the nerve. We can burn those nerves. So there's a lot of options we have. Um, just because someone says, oh, patients come to me just so disappointed. Well, I have arthritis in my back. There's really nothing I can do about that. Well, you're right, there's not, we can't take it out, but we could try these things to see if, although the arthritis is there, you don't necessarily hurt from it. Then the neuraxial compartment is where the epidural steroid injections come in. And again, epidural steroid injection, so many different kinds of epidurals. So again, patients say, oh, I had an ESI five years ago, it really helped. Well, okay, what kind of ESI? Was it a selective nerve root block? What, did they take a midline approach? Was it a transforaminal approach? I mean, these are a lot of different types of epidurals that we can do. I get a lot of referrals from surgeons wanting a selective nerve root block for surgical planning. That, okay, there, were, there have been studies that have shown that if a patient gets 50 or 70% or more relief from a selective nerve root block, then their prognosis or their chances of doing well after surgery are much, much higher. So, um, and that includes cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. There are lumbar, I mean, there are thoracic epidural steroid injections that we can do. Um, it's a little bit less common, but it is possible. And then we have the anterior compartment, where we have the, um, the discs and the vertebral bodies. The vertebral bodies with the compression fractures, those are the augmentation procedures, the kyphoplasties, the vertebroplasties, and we all know the recent studies that have come out with that, lots of controversy on that. Um, so, these. so that was my talk. Um, there are flyers and cards outside, so please um, you know, grab one. Send us referrals if you have any questions. Um, you don't, they don't necessarily have to have imaging before they come and see us. Um, we are really trying to be kind of that first stop before a lot of people think that, oh, I have back pain, I need to go see the surgeon. No, not necessarily. You know, I can help you with that. I can order the imaging if we need to order imaging. We can try and do some treatments before going to the surgeon, and I can, we can always go to the surgeon if we need to, um, if that's the appropriate thing to do. But thank you for your attention.